Chairman Benjamin. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you, sir. Approval of the minutes. Next item on the agenda. Of course, everyone had a chance to look at them. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Second. Mm -hmm. Mr. Leonard. Mr. Alford. Yes. Ms. Pease. Yes. Mr. Turner. Yes. Mr. Viejo. Yes. Mrs. Cook. Yes. Chairman Benjamin. Yes, sir. They are approved. And while we're on the subject of old minutes being the uh, or old business, would you bring us up to date? Mr. Leonard, on the La Borgata <coughs> issue, would you bring the council, or excuse me, the board up to date? Yes, the city council heard the rehearing, and they continued the hearing to allow staff to try one more time to get a response from the other two property owners um, on whether they, they care one way or the other about the request. Uh, we've made contact with one of the owners, the far east end, the other business professional piece, and he was actually in favor of it. The others, the other, which is the, the large owner of it, the Nash York, uh, uh, we've, we've made contact with the New York portion of that ownership and the Nashville uh, portion of that, but we haven't had any response yet. So legal is going to send them a letter and let them know that in uh, our attorney's mind now, He's at a point where he's comfortable that if we send a letter asking for their comments and none are forthcoming, the jurisdiction of the council would still be that such that they can take action on it. Just because we don't hear from them doesn't mean that the council can't take action on their, that request. So it'll be to let the owners know that by not responding is a response. So, But if they do respond and have objections to it, then that will be reported back to the city council and that likely would be the end of it. But the uh, this Thursday's city council meeting, it's on the agenda to schedule that continued hearing for sometime in January. So we'll follow back up with you once that's scheduled so that you will know in case you want to attend to see how the, uh, the results of that hearing. Thank you. Also under old business, uh, at, the, at the last meeting we talked about the possibility of updating the list of requirements <coughs> for hardship uh, for variance requests. Can you bring this up to date on that, please, while you can? Yes. Uh, it's. <coughs> It's planned to be on one of the January city council uh, meetings for discussion to see if they're interested, by, like what we did, just throw out an idea about what maybe criteria number nine might be when you're looking at a hardship variance and see if they like that idea as well. So I would expect that at your February meeting that if they do like the idea that we would have something that we could discuss more and see if you want to take action on. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Ms. Cook? Very good. Jennings Act, would you inform the audience, please, of the importance of the Jennings Act so we can start in on item one? Yes, sir. At the beginning of each of these requests, and we have three of them today, each of the board, board members will uh, do what we call a Jennings disclosure because they sit as a quasi-judicial board. They, they sit as judges. They're not making law. They're actually applying the law that's already in place. And so what they will, uh, what the Jennings disclosure is, is recognizing that Unlike a judge, they will, the city council, planning board, you'll come to the meeting with some knowledge uh, in addition to what you hear at the meeting and helping to make up your mind. The Jennings disclosure is a way of disclosing uh, conversations you've had outside of this meeting, whether you know the applicants and they've contacted you or people who are against it, if they've contacted you, the nature of that discussion, so that anyone on the opposing side that happens to be in the room, they could cross-examine you or, or actually let you know or cross-examine the people who you had the conversation with so that they feel like they get their point across so that you're not just getting one side of it. So the Jennings disclosure is to disclose such as if you know where the property is because by that way you already started forming some sort of opinion about how it's situated amongst the other properties. Whether anyone's contacted you for or against it in the nature of that conversation so that everyone in the room can hear all the same information so when you make a decision everyone's heard everything that has taken place in the discussions all in the same room at the same time. And we'll do that at the beginning of each one of these. And the first two items, the, um, the variance request on Christopher and the conditional use for the miracle strip, those are decisions that 
that you make and those decisions become final if no one appeals it. If someone appeals it, your order, then it would go to the city council for final determination. Item number three, which is the conditional use at the old Publix building there on Middle Beach Road, Hutchinson Boulevard, that is a request for greater than three acres in size. So your decision today is a recommendation only. No appeal would be necessary. It's gonna to go to the city council no matter what. Whatever you decide today will be just a recommendation. It will go to the city council. Uh, at this Thursday's council meeting, we're also gonna schedule when that hearing will be in January as well. So after Thursday, we will uh, we'll know the date for it and the La Brigada piece and we'll get all the information out, get it on the website so that everybody can see when that, that hearing will be. Thank you. For item number one, Mr. Alford, would you start with the Jennings Act, please? Uh, nothing, to, nothing to make work. Uh, yes, I went out to the property and met with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Matheson and discussed um, some setbacks of the water and sewer and the fact that what the property was before it was turned into homes and um, just uh, went inside the garage and looked at the area to determine if a garage was necessary. I went by the property. I did not talk to anyone. I just went by. Maybe that was my fault. Just the location of the property. I went by the property, looked around, looked around surrounding properties, and I spoke to no one. I did the same. I went by the property, actually walked around it, um, and the neighbor on the other side as well, but I didn't speak to anybody. I've been by the property twice, and I've spoken to no one regarding the issue. Item number one, Karen and Richard Matson are requesting authorization to reduce the required 20-foot setback by six feet for a 14-foot front yard setback. The property is located 166 Christopher Drive. Mr. Matson or Mrs. Hmm. You make me speak. <laughs> I think you all have a picture of the oh, house. Name and address, please. For the oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Richard Matson, uh, 166 Christopher Drive, Panama City Beach. It's my wife, Karen, back there. Um, we've lived in the Gulf Islands uh, established since 1968. We chose it simply because of its proximity to Frank Brown Park. We had six young kids at the time and they were all participating in sports. And My wife didn't have to be a taxi cab. They could just walk across to that area. But we chose it simply because of that and then it's um, safe elevation as far as hurricanes and stuff. The uh, Kalina Circle at the top is 55 feet. Our area is 38 feet. Um, we're both retired for four years now and we choose to stay here um, but we'd like to upgrade the home add a two-car garage on there um, keep the cars out of the elements and uh, there's a lot of feral cats in the area and the uh, numerous mornings we've gotten up and they're sleeping on our car and the price of cars today the scratches are pretty tough um, but we're, with the present cardboard, I think you all have pictures, uh, we'd actually be adding on 32 inches with that six foot variance from there. So it'd be 32 inches closer to the street? From the carport that's there, yes. Yeah. Um, the setback is 14 and a half feet from the street is where our setback is, starts. And so that's where the 20 feet goes from there. But um, I don't know why there's so, such a big setback out there. We don't have curb and gutter, and we don't have sidewalks. There's only two water lines that run in there in that 14 feet, so that's a lot of weights of space. Um, there was a letter, but the, uh, the wife called yesterday and was wondering if we were interested in buying that property. So I don't know why she was contesting it. It would add to the value of the property that's already there. But that's all I have. We had the one letter in opposition that, or, or at least a statement from that thing, that's what he's referring to. Okay, just a moment on that. Does anyone have any questions? 
there any comments? A couple of things. When you said the setback was 14 and a half feet, you're talking about 14 and a half foot um, is where the water and sewer path is located, 14 and a half feet from the road. To our property line, yeah, the edge to, of the tarp. So for those of you that don't know, he's saying that um, the water and sewer, the city, Panama City Beach, comes forward about 14 and a half feet up into the yard, and then the 20-foot setback starts there. Correct. So all in all, it's 30 foot. Yeah, feet to the 20 road. feet, so yes. But the property right to the east of us, their house faces Chris, or Escanaba Drive, and as I understood it from Ken Thorndike, if they build a garage there, they only need a, it's either a five or a seven foot setback on theirs. So that is gonna sit way out in front of our house. And then one of the other neighbors has a carport right up the street from us that is probably maybe four or five feet from the setback line. Yeah, um, I was gonna, now it was a, that whole subdivision was a trailer park prior to it being set up for homes. So that's what, I couldn't understand why every house had double lots. Yeah. That, that's what that was about. Mm -hmm. um, and I was going to bring up the fact that one of the houses was very, the carport was very close to the road already. Um, mm -hmm. And when I went in your house, now your washer and dryer and air conditioning unit um, and hot water heater is all inside that garage. Correct, yeah. I'm not sure ever how it was a two car to begin with. Well, <laughs> well I compact cars, I think. Compact they car. They were probably all <laughs> smart cars, one part <laughs> behind the other. I'm not sure. But the inside width of the garage is it's about 15 feet from the washer to that back door. But like I said, if you got the pictures of the house, we're only adding 32 inches onto the present carport. So when I was at your house, basically you want, your, your structure would be where the carport is. Correct. And you're going to tie it onto your roof. Correct. And then it's going to come out towards the street 32 Additional inches. 32 additional inches. Uh -huh. and, and from your setback to the street right now, there's 34 feet? 31 feet. From, no, no, from the carport to the street, to the edge of the tar street, it's 31 feet right now. For some reason, their water meters are way up yeah, into, I saw that. into the lot. I saw that. But so I was adding 14 and 20 somewhere. That was to the house. But he's saying to the, house. the carport okay. is only 31. Mm -hmm. to, to the Present carport is 20 feet. But his, set, his setback from the carport to the front property line is about 14 feet. Correct. To his property line. Now. Not, not to the street. Not to the his paved property. portion of the street. That's even more. But from the property marker post to the street, it's an additional 14 and a half feet. So it's a large setback. I don't know why it's so far in. I really don't. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Mel, on the corner lot there, um, and apparently Mr. Thorndike went out and talked to him about it. Can you explain why their setback? Um, would be considerably less. I mean, just I don't know if we have that. We just set up here. See if we can tell that. The, the lot I believe he was referring to is, is this house facing Escanaba. So this would be a side street setback over here, and he could they could end up having a uh, an accessory structure uh, quite a bit closer than what he would have. Could you, could you see, look at the one directly on top of that one? Directly on top of that one. That one is about five feet away from the fence, isn't it? Yes. I looked a, at that. Right. Because it's, uh, it's, side it's, side it's a side setback of five feet as opposed to 20. So, But that's on that same street. Yes, because okay. they front the other street. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Okay, I'll make one just for the record. Um, 
to be, um, in order for us to approve this, we're supposed to um, meet all eight requirements um, for the LDC section 90303, and uh, this request um, does not meet them. Well, we already know that. Um, so that's all I want to say about it. That's why I brought it up to Mr. Leonard to begin with. Um, this is an item we discussed at the last meeting. And this, in my opinion, needs to be modified. Uh, is there a motion to approve? Or does anyone have oh, public comment? Mr. Leonard, you owe us a letter there. Yes, sir. Thank you for reminding me. This is an email from Carl Engel. And it's about 166 Christopher. I am in the process of selling 163 Christopher Drive. I do not want anything constructed which will devaluate our property at 163 Christopher Drive, which is located within 150 feet of this variance request. K. Engel. Carl Engel. Does everyone see the copy of that? Okay. Any further public comment, one way or the other? Thank you. Available for a motion. Our I motion. Well, go ahead. I'll make a motion that we approve it. I second it. Motion's been approved and seconded. Mr. Leonard? Yes, sir. Mrs. Cook? Yes. Mr. Viejo? Yes. Mr. Turner? Yes. Ms. Pease? Yes. Mr. Alford? Yes. Chairman Benjamin? Protest vote, no. The variance is approved. Can I ask a question that doesn't have anything to do with the variance? Mm -hmm. did, did anybody find the numbering on this street a little weird? The what? The, the numbering, numbering on the street? Yes, because of the double lots where it mm -hmm. used to be a trailer park, so it really lots. Bounces back and bounces left and forth. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Alford, Jennings Act Disclosure, please, for item number two. Yes, uh, Mr. Benjamin, I just would like it to be known that, uh, for, for those of you who don't know, I work for the staff of the Panama City Beach Chamber of Commerce. And uh, it's an organization of businesses which uh, Miracle Strip is a member of. And uh, I wanted that to be known because uh, my position there on staff has in no effect whatsoever on any of the business before this planning board right now when it involves the nature of the Strip Amusement Park. So I just wanted that to be known. Thank you. Any time, have you been by the property or any? Many times. Okay. Actually attended its groundbreaking to that extent. It was the most Mr. Ever. Mr. Chairman, can I ask one thing? Did the applicants or, or anybody for it or against it talk to you specifically about this request? And if so, uh, what was the nature of the conversation? Not a single living soul. Could be dead living soul. <laughs> <laughs> Clear enough. That's for another meeting. <laughs> Stay on time. Uh, <laughs> okay. Ms. Nothing. Blair? Nothing. I've been by the property, but that's all. I've been by the property, have spoken to no one. Same here. Um, actually, um, for those of you who don't know, I used to be the director of development and marketing for Simon, in which the Meeks became a part of the Simon property group over there. So we've known each other for five years, and um, we are friends and acquaintances. Um, but I have nothing to do with their business or anything like that. I, too, was at the groundbreaking with Skip and many other in our community. So. Okay. I have walked the property twice, but I've spoken with no one. Item number two, conditional use request to expand a previously approved amusement park at 284 Powell Adams Road um, onto additional adjacent vacant land. Mr. Lee. Sure. Hello. Adele Lee, 101 Monte Paolo Street. Um, and I'd like to say that uh, Teddy and Jenny Meeks are here as well. And if you have any questions for them, if they want to comment, uh, they're available for that. Um, I'd like to thank you for hearing this uh, conditional use request. 
And if you remember, we came before the board earlier this year uh, with a conditional use request and a uh, variance, fencing variance request for the 10 acre uh, parcel. Um, Mel, can you? Yes. Uh, this request is almost an extension of that original request. Um, as you'll notice, there's a parcel immediately to the left, to the west of the originally um, granted uh, 10 acres. That parcel is 65 feet wide on the north width. It's 101 feet wide on the southern width, and it's 1,100 feet long. The southern one third of that property of this parcel under discussion is approximately is 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 wetlands and pond. Um, you also notice that, that this parcel is landlocked, and given uh, the shape of that property, there's really very little use that can be made of that property, except if it's um, joined with one of the properties on either side. Little use that can be made of that. Um, if the uh, conditional use is granted, there, the parking for this parcel has already been incorporated, incorporated into the design. There will have to be an update to the parking study to be done, but as we understand it, no additional parking will be required. If there is, it will be very minimal. Um, and concerning the fencing variance, um, speaking with Mel, the we don't have to request a fencing variance because if this conditional use is granted, it'll become part of the same development and the fencing variance will apply to both properties as if they're one. So their, their common perimeter will become the, what's required for the fencing variance. Um, one thing to make note of in consideration, if you remember originally when we came to you, the roller coaster, the Starliner roller coaster that used to be at the old Miracle Strip is coming back. And the original plan was to run that coaster in the entire length from north to south <coughs> on the along the western property line. And that would it would take it from the north front boundary to the southern boundary, which would get it pretty close to um, Front Beach Road. But with the addition of this property and a little other configure reconfigurations, the coaster could actually start and run, start on the northern boundary and run west and turn south then. And, and the turnaround would be 400 feet further north than what we would have to do if we go back to the, just the 10 acres. In addition to that, the fun part of the ride would be pointed pretty much west. So you'd hit the screams. <laughs> <laughs> would be, you know, focused a little more towards Pier Park than getting down towards the condos and, and the uh, hotels and such as that. So um, I think maybe you want to consider that. I think it's a, I think it's a benefit to, uh, to consider it that way. And that's all I had unless you have any questions at this time. You're going to be going over the wetlands to the south, you said the bottom third? If, if, if this variance is granted, we won't, we won't have to go. Uh, Across the wetlands, with the miracle, with the uh, with the Starliner. Yeah, just the conditional use. He said variance, just the conditional. I'm sorry, use. conditional use, conditional use. I have one question uh, under number nine of the staff analysis about the um, exposed blaring noise associated with the amusement park. Are y'all going to be doing any additional uh, landscaping or anything? Having to do with noise that's that flanking and screaming. Nothing, nothing beyond um, what was originally planned for. And your traffic study has been done. It has been done. And it the is. The development order has been issued. Is there 
it is um, pending a couple of items, but it's effective. And then you have also got your pro rata share of your contribution to the uh, roadway. That's correct. Uh, improvements. That's correct. Already paid. Them. Thank you. Quick question. Yes. Just because it's it's shooting out to the west just a little bit farther, I know that the, the speed helicopters down there. Mm -hmm. That isn't going to affect his flight path or anything at all, is it? I, I can't comment on his flight path, but I know it'll I know it'll be further away from his landing from further his landing away. further away. The, uh, we're talking about the roller coaster, right? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Not now. Thank you. So anyone else who would like to, from the audience, who would like to address this one way or the other? Any comments? Sir. I'm John Alagaman, uh, CRA manager. Uh, I'm the one that reviewed the traffic study. Um, one thing uh, that mentioned, uh, yes, the, the traffic study has been approved for what has been proposed up to date. If, they, if you grant this conditional use, they have to revise their study to add the additional acreage. I believe they're proposing two acres. Yeah. Yeah. So based on that, uh, it, it could generate more threats there will be additional transportation fee for the project. Just want to clarify that as well. You don't foresee any problems with, the, with it being the additional traffic? Huh? No, no. The, the capacity is there, obviously, and they have compensated for additional trip. It's just a matter of going through the process. Yeah, and the Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any additional comments from anyone? Okay. Any discussion? Amongst ourselves? Mr. Leonard, will the issuance of the conditional use on these 2.6 acres, would that carry the same as what we had put on the previous property? Or is there going to be a difference in what we're looking <coughs> at for requirements? Um, I don't believe the applicants asked for any other special consideration, so I would assume that it's going to, it's adding on to the existing conditional use so that the same the same conditions you had on the other parts of the property would be on this, through on this piece okay. as well. I just want mm -hmm. to clarify that. Yes, sir. Okay. And the fence is going to move to the west. Yes, because the variance at the time was to put the, the, the fencing that is going to occur would be on the boundary of the property. Well, now the boundary is just moving over 200 more feet to the west, so that's where it'll be. So, Mel, the height of that coaster falls under the height that we discussed for admission? Yes. Any further discussion? Open for a motion. A motion to approve. Second. Second. Third. Third. <laughs> <laughs> motion by Mr. or Ms. Clare. Second by Mr. Alford. Roll, please. Yes, sir. <coughs> Mr. Alford? Yes. Ms. Pease? Yes. Mr. Turner? Yes. Mr. Viejo? Yes. Mrs. Cook? Yes. Chairman Benjamin? Yes. The conditional use is approved. Okay. Let me stop just for a second. Ms. Andrea, can you hand me um, the package here before we start any further? Or just can you go and hand me one of my files and I'll pick it up? Very good. Okay. Mr. Alford. Jennings Act, please. Item number three, conditional use request for approval of a multi-use entertainment facility at 1120, 11220 Hutchinson Beach Boulevard. I've been by the property numerous times, front and back, all around, but have not talked to anyone at this time. I've, I've been to the project um, several times. I spoke with uh, Clyde Snodgrass. Um, he had some concerns. Um, I don't know what part he actually played in the group, but apparently he's, he's um, 
involved in it in some way. I'm not certain what, what title it was, but uh, she was concerned about uh, the cost of the TAP fees, um, traffic study, and cost of roadway improvements, um, which I can bring up these things to ask Mel some questions that she had concerns with, but other than that, I've spoken to um, also someone with Edgewater Beach, Beach Resort. And I am familiar with the property, having worked on the property since it was built over there, so I'm quite familiar with it. But uh, I, I did speak with Mr. Leonard uh, concerning the parking and the number of persons versus the square footage of the property. Other than that, I spoke with uh, Berg Management, and they had no opinion one way or the other on it. They managed the Palm Cove. Nothing to declare. Um, I've been around the property several times as well and actually received a call from Mr. Pitts um, just informing me that he was on the agenda, which we know. So no discussion other than that. Okay. I walked the property a few times and I spoke um, with the police chief this morning at length and have had no further discussion with anyone. Item number three, Mr. Pitts. Take your time. You want? Yes. Okay. We're going to pause just for a moment while we change the disc. And then we can.
We're good. Yeah, it's a Decker overhaul, or you like the way it's centered on the ground? You ready? Chris Pitts, 5318 Beach Drive, Panama City Beach, Florida. Um, I am uh, the owner of Meridian Live. Um, what we are proposing, uh, first off, uh, Chairman, members of the board, thank you for uh, letting us come up here and, and explain some of these things and answer some questions that I know you probably have as well as some members of the audience might have as well. Um, we did have last Tuesday an open house um, for people to come and ask some questions. Uh, we invited the, the letters we sent out for the um, conditional use process that people within 300 feet of the property got a letter with an invite to an open house. Uh, we have a pretty good uh, turnout on that. Um, and a lot of people that showed up um, all had very similar questions. I think we, after about an hour or so, got most of those questions. I think most everybody left feeling relieved and feeling that they have a better understanding of the project. Uh, but this, anytime something new comes in town, there's a lot of rumors, a lot of speculation about what it's going to be what it could turn into, especially with some of the history, uh, specifically with this conditional use process that we've had. There's been some, some applications that have been granted and they've ended up being a nuisance or an issue after the fact. And that after speeding with city staff, I think there were there was con some concerns that once we, if this was to be approved, and I did not, or we did not run the business the way that we had said that we would or promised we would, there was really no mechanism in place to make sure that we could, we would, I guess, stand by our word. and. Um, so I'll address some, some things we put in place um, to help hopefully um, make people feel a little better about the fact that we put some self-imposed restrictions. There is a, a mechanism in place to keep us from going and doing something unlike anything other than what we you know, promised we would be doing. Um, first and foremost, um, I'm sorry, but she was over paying attention to class. A little short term, nothing much. Um, but first, what, we, what this business is is we want to take that public uh, shopping center. It's been sitting there vacant for a little over four years, I guess, and really try to rehab the facility. Uh, right now, it's a disrepair. It's falling apart. Um, and to be honest with you, there's not a whole lot of potential uses for that space um, unless it's, you know, without going through this process, unless you got a, some more meeting space or maybe a church or something like that. But no big box is going to move into this facility anymore. That's all happening on the West End. So, you know, the new building owner that purchased the building back uh, – back in early in the year, has been approached by all kinds of people, especially during the spring break time period, of want, people want to get in and, and open something, a pop-up type business, or use it for an events or concerts for a short period of time, then bail out. Um, so when you first approached him about this, um, we got kind of, we were kind of treated the same way, and then we actually met, sent our information, and actually we started going through the process and seeing what we're doing and vetting it, and ended up agreeing to our terms. And just, um, little bit of background about the owner. The owner, Hubert Phillips, um, who owns um, a lot of different things in the area. He also owns Halifax Media, and which is the News Herald and some, several other um, uh, newspapers. So he has every intention to make sure that any decision he makes at least a building to somebody is not going to come in and buy him the butt afterwards. Um, that's just bad PR for anybody. Um, and over the course of the five or six month vetting process that we went uh, with him and his staff, um, they dug into everything we're doing, dug into our business plan, um, went over everything we were proposing and doing, and um, came on around and you know, overwhelming support on it because they understood the project. I think so many people were concerned when they heard, first heard about, you know, somebody wanted to move into this building was that, oh my goodness, they want to turn into another nightclub or another La Vila 2.0 or some other kind of business that, you know, let's be honest, we don't need any more nightclubs. Um, Panama City Beach is not the same as it was in the 1990s. Uh, we're proposing an entirely different use for the property, which is why we're going to this conditional use process, but it's not a nightclub. Um, it will not be operated as a nightclub. Um, this is a convent, uh, convention, event, and meetings facility, and a restaurant. Um, we're going to take the space and divide it up in a couple of different areas. Um, first part, we'll, uh, we're going to divide the building to a 16,000 square foot restaurant. That restaurant is going to be like House of Blues style entertainment, um, full sit down uh, restaurant. Um, they'll have live nightly jazz, blues, and comedy acts. And that will be open seven nights a week. That will be our 365 business. Um, 
the remainder of the space, the additional 40,000 square foot, um, that's going to be used as our convention event facility. Um, and we have every intention of using it as an event and convention facility, uh, nothing more. Um, I'm going to click over just a second. Did you say 48,000 square foot? 40,000 square foot. Um, uh, I didn't mean to go over here. Um, 40,000 square foot, and actually usable convention space, um, it's about 23,000 square foot. Um, the rest of that is offices, back storage, things of like that. And I'll bring up a, um, a sample um, layout in just a few minutes. Um, what you're seeing here is uh, from the attorney regarding the lease um, on, the, on the building. Um, a quick uh, little overview of how this is laid out. Um, initially, we have a one-year lease on this property. And that is done for one specific reason, to make sure that we do come in and operate as we say we're going to. Um, that was proposed by us to, after talking with city, um, city staff about if this was granted, what is in place to make sure we live up to our end of the bargain. So we talked to the landlord and had some things stuck into our lease to help kind of police that to make sure we are operating the way we say we will. Um, first off, can I be used as a nightclub? Pretty obvious. It's there several times. Um, I'm going to click over here again. Sorry. Guys. <coughs> Please see the permitted use. First class venue for concerts, conventions, sporting events, entertainment, including without limitation, sit down, full service restaurant. You can see the rest of it there. Shall not be a nightclub. Very clear there. Another language we had added in. As you can see. Limits the types of events and some of the things that we can't do in this facility. No phone parties, no crazy contests, no vulgar concerts, um, no street parties. You kind of see there's a lot of a lot of things in there that people assume with the nightclub or that kind of industry are a business that operates as a nightclub. And once again, we stuck this in place to make sure that we couldn't do anything like that. And so the city would feel safe and the residents in the area would feel safe that we have, once again, every, you know, every, we mean what we're going to say, what we say. We're going to do what we, as we promised and, and play by the rules here. We've also, we've also, um, also included some um, self-imposed restrictions that we added to the lease that we asked to be added to the lease. Uh, you see some of them there regarding noise. Um, the nightclub's in there again as well. And also limits the number of events during the month of March, which is what after city staff has brought to our attention is one of, their, is one of the biggest concerns is the amount of events that we were to come in, open up for a month, and do a bunch of stuff that would essentially bring spring break to a traditionally non-spring break corridor. We have no intention of doing that, um, but we do plan on if we do move forward this process as operating as an event and convention facility, which would mean doing one concert a, uh, a week during the month of March just because it's spring break. It's a lot of good, um, a lot of good money to be made there. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's one business on this beach that can survive shutting down the entire month of March. All we want is to be able to come in and work with the city on either days or times um, to be able to put those one shows a week. Um, to where it helps, we're not running into issues with some other events that might be going on in the area or some of the stuff that's going on in the South Thomas Drive area. Um, just as I said, um, do, do what we can to work with the city. Um, you can see the city staff uh, notes that they put that we've been very open and, and, and amenable to any suggestions they had just because you know, we're, we're trying to, to prove the fact that we are traditionally, we're actually opening a meeting, convention facility, and a restaurant. Um, our initial proposal um, was to uh, open the main hall first in time for spring break and do some shows and then after that to bring on the restaurant online sometime around summer. Um, after meeting with people and, and city staff uh, we decided to either, even help kind of clarify any any lingering doubt that we would be operating as a pop-up club to scrub that idea and operate and open the restaurant first, move into the building first and then open up the main hall in time for summer. Um, we did that just because th we would think that would help clarify, any, once again, any ideas that this might be some kind of pop-up club or temporary business. And I've heard all kinds of things, concerns that we were going to come in and gut the building and throw a bunch of concerts and walk away, or that there's a bunch of out-of-town money coming in to, to bankroll this. These are all local people. It's a family business. It's local investors that we have here. Um, there's no major company. There's no major corporations. I'm here speaking uh, on behalf of myself. Um, and uh, uh, you know, 
this is you know, all local, is everybody involved here. And uh, as I, like I said, it's, it's, it's very tough for people like us to do because we're not, you know, we're not a major corporation. So everything done is self-performed ourselves. And uh, you know, over the last three or four years when we first started this process, um, that was every intention. We looked at several different businesses, several different lo locations, looked at some stuff at Pier Park and was trying to see about maybe building something. Um, looked at the old um, Wayne's World, old Walmart location over there by the overpass. And um, kept going back to this location, the public location, because, I mean, it looks like a convention center. It's in a great location. And to be a convention center, excuse me, uh, you have to be next to resorts and condos. And being that that's how we plan on operating our business, the convention facility, being next to those helps. The other facility over and on uh, by the bridge had nothing there. There were some proposed um, development that was talked about at one point by building a hotel and some things behind there, and that was why we considered that location. But once that all fell through, we went back to the public shopping center. Um, now, there's a couple of issues that, that, we, that, we're, that we are most definitely aware of and the city staff has, has you know, made comments on, uh, first and foremost being traffic and parking. Um, what we plan on doing um, for the, the initial first year of, of operation is uh, to utilize the 300 spots that we have now currently, and then for any special event or major event that we have um, that would require off additional parking, uh, we've had conversations with um, Shipwreck and with Edgewater. Uh, no agreements yet, but had, had some conversations regarding it about utilizing one of those two locations for off-site overflow parking. And uh, we'd run a shuttle um, to the, from the business back to our park lot and, and, and so on. Um, once again, we have no, we have no uh, agreements signing up. We did have conversations. I feel pretty confident one of those two will come come through for us. Um, as a permanent parking solution though, um, sometime during the first term of business, once we get some cash flow coming back in, uh, we have uh, approached the owners of the, of the property right next door. I think it's seven or eight acres um, right next door about taking a few of those acres and um, cleaning it up, planting some sod, and using that as a grass kind of overflow, permanent, o permanent overflow parking section so we're not having to utilize a off-site business for that as well. Um, I think that Anybody you ask that has taken the time to understand this project and, and gotten to know us and know what our intentions are is very supportive of the project. But there are concerns, obviously, and there's, and there's you know, some of those are valid concerns, um, the parking and the traffic. Um, and then, you know, if you live in the area, what, what, what are these concerts, what does that mean to you, how would it affect you, would it, the noise bother you, would traffic bother you, whatever else. Um, and, you know, we spent a lot of time addressing these different issues and thinking about them. Um, we kind of brief, briefly talked in the parking. Um, the traffic situation, um, being that we um, plan to operate any special event or concert that does happen, um, would be a, tr a traditionally considered for traffic non-peak time. It'd be between the hours of 7 o'clock um, and midnight. Uh, there'd be nothing past that. We actually have a self-imposed, uh, you see on there, at 1 a.m., which means the business must be closed at 1 a.m. Um, now, we plan on any event that we did have, we'd wrap up at midnight, and then in order to have an orderly exit um, after the, after the, uh, the event, uh, we would end the show, play some music, and let people just kind of wander out and, and stretch that, that exit over the course of an hour instead of turning the lights on, kicking out everybody in the street. Um, I think the, the, the police would welcome that, our, our security would welcome that as well, and it makes more for a much more organized and orderly uh, exit um, in, in the event that we do have something like that. Um, I think that another concern that a lot of people had um, was the noise. And uh, if we do, if we are doing these types of events, what kind of impact is that going to have in some of the Palm Bay people or Edgewater across the street? Um, well, I'll click over real quick. <laughs> Sorry about that. So you kind of see this is a sample layout of the building. here the section with the tables is left hand side that is the restaurant and uh, lounge area that, was, that has a fixed stage because we'll be doing live entertainment jazz blues and comedy acts nightly um, the kitchen in the back the, the remainder space over to the side is our main event hall that right there is situated um, in the middle of the building with a barrier of rooms and storage rooms around it um, that is done specifically to, because um, we actually we made this facility smaller, uh, or the actual main hall smaller, so we can incorporate um, some of this airspace and create some 
overflow additional storage around the building. Um, that is done to create airspace, which is to help um, with any noise bleed through. That, that would happen if, for an event if we did have a major event or concert. Um, if you look at this uh, plan, you see that there's two, three, seven, four walls in between certain areas of the beach. Um, there is no permanent platform or stage in the main hall. Um, it's just there as a scale for drawing, um, the drawing itself. Um, there is no permanent stage in this building. It's, it's actually a convention facility. Our stage is a portable, broke down stage uh, that's in eight by eight uh, sizes pieces that we can reconfigure. So if we have a graduation ceremony, if we have a meeting with a small platform, or if we have a, some, a fashion show or something like that, it could be reconfigured um, to customized to the, to the type of event that we are, we are doing. So there is no fixed stage in there. Um, and I think the, after speaking with our sound engineer, the weakest part of this entire building, um, there's not gonna be sound bleeding from the, the walls, it's gonna be from the roof. And that's what we identified the, the weakest spot of the building. But after dealing with speaking with our engineer and our architect and actually digging into it, um, that's not just a standard metal roof. Um, uh, but it's just a metal with, a, with the asphalt on top. It's about two foot thick. Um, and it's got multiple layers and insulation board in between there. Um, all of us drop down ceiling tiles over in um, the currently in the public's location. None of those are insulated. They're just there to, to drop down the ceiling. Um, so we, um, with the addition of some, some bass traps and some sound treatment that we plan on doing ourselves uh, to the wall perimeter and to spray insulation on the ceiling, um, feel like there won't be any impact and noise to the, um, the Palm Cove Shopping Center as well, or uh, subdivision or the Edgewaters. Um, and I think that um, lastly, uh, I think the biggest concern was where I came from. I think a lot of people that if you know anything about me or have been in this town, you know that I worked at La Vila for 10 years. And La Vila is a dirty word here. <laughs> and uh, I can say that uh, we started this process about three or four years ago. And um, we started this process because when I was hired on La Vila, there were certain things that we were promised and I was promised and things that we were allowed to, to do and to take over. And it became apparent that they had no intention of evolving or growing or doing anything, other, anything else other than what they're currently doing. And you know, more power to them, that's their business, they can run it the way they, they please. That's just what I was, was, I was not brought on board for that. Um, we had better ideas and things we wanted to kind of move on, expand on, and we didn't see eye to eye on that. So um, once again, we said three or four years ago, we started this process. And just here in the last several months, um, we were able to get the rest of the funding that we needed, and we did leave La Vila to pursue this. And I say that just because La Vila's, you know, there's been so many issues with the types of events that La Vila does or types of crowd that La Vila uh, attracts. And this is not a nightclub. This is a year-round facility. I'm not looking to open up and do a bunch of stuff for spring break. I'm looking to just do something, you know. Um, that event, this facility be utilized year round for tons of different types of uses, um, meetings, conventions, um, even a sound stage. As, um, after speaking with our, some, a lot of people who are in the, in the, the area regarding in the production field, um, there's no sound stage anywhere um, in North Florida. The closest sound stages are down south, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Miami area, and there's about 10 in Atlanta, but there's nothing in between. And there's about 10 to 15 films right now that are actually very interested in shooting in an area. But the biggest air turnoff is the lack of a sound stage. So that's one of the many potential uses that we do have here. Uh, the next is sports, indoor sports. Uh, Richard and them have done a great job of bringing a lot of sports tourism to our area. Um, we see it every summer between the softball and the cheerleading, the different groups like that. Um, but we have limited facilities that are available. Um, this would be, I think, one of those assets that he could use um, to do different types of things and expand that year-round tourism by going into some more volleyball, basketball, things like that. Now, um, in order to do that, um, our, our third phase is actually to the main event hall area is going to be taking cut out and that area raised to 10 additional feet, which would give us a 30-foot clearance um, in the Spain space. That, at the same time, will, will eliminate these center pilings in the middle, which would give us a wide open space for Three, three different basketball courts or, or four volleyball courts or, you know, big cheerleading competitions, karate, boxing, MMA, whatever. Um, it really makes the venue a little more flexible for the indoor sports. As, the, as it sits right now currently, we'll have about 20-foot ceiling, which will allow it to do some things, but it won't really open up to the sports stuff until we actually raise the roof. And we've uh, already met with a company that's came down to look at that quote us on that, and it's actually very reasonable. It's much cheaper than building a new building somewhere else. Um, as far as um, 
the type of business that we plan on running. Um, when we first started this process, you know, one thing we talked about with our investors and ourselves is that we didn't want to open up just another hospitality venue that um, would hire a bunch of part-time employees, pay them minimum wage, and then lay them off at the end of the year. Um, a promise we made to our investors and ourselves that any, anybody that we hire is going to pay them above minimum, minimum wage. Um, and after six months, people will be offered health benefits, regardless of if they're full-time or part-time. And the reason we're doing that is because we want to attract the best. We want to get a great staff. And if you, anybody in the hospitality industry will tell you that it's all about hospitality. It's all about you know, treating the customer right. And, and it, the only way to do that is to keep good staff. And uh, so that's one of the ways we plan on, on doing that is to you know, keep that, uh, that staff by paying them a, a, a nice way, a wage above a living wage, paying them more so we can attract the best and the brightest. Um, as far as that, um, I'm sure you guys have lots of questions. I'm sure there's lots of people in the audience that have lots of comments on this or questions for me. So uh, if you do have any questions on what I've gone over so far. Uh, I have yes, ma'am. And they're going to kind of bounce back, with, back and forth to me. On, but I, I was, I'm just trying to get a good understanding. Um, first, let me talk yeah. about Mr. Snodgrass that called uh, Mel. He, he was, can you talk a little bit about the traffic study and why? Every development has to have it, and the um, the uh, the cost of such a traffic study, if you know that, and then uh, the roadway improvements. He was unsure why they needed to pay for road improvements when the building already existed. Um, so, if you can, can you? I can do the, the setup, but I'll ask uh, John Legamon to come back up, and I have some comments on that as okay, well. well we, can, we, can, we can jump back to that in a minute, and then I can skip that. He actually long. is the uh, uh, he's the CRA director, and he also looks at all of the uh, the traffic studies and the transportation requirements, and applies them when development orders come in. But the city has a proportionate share um, fee that's associated with development and redevelopment uh, when there's an impact on roadways. And the, uh, the, the Florida legislature actually said local governments have to give developers this ability to be able to pay and go. That if they have a traffic impact, that they pay whatever that cost is without having to construct it. And then the local government ends up having the burden for uh, actually constructing it. The good thing is, is that we have the Front Beach Road CRA, which is a funding mechanism uh, for a comprehensive transportation improvement program. So John, being the CRA director, has gone through and, and works with the city council sitting as the, the CRA, the agency, in prioritizing which roadway improvements occur, and that's how Churchwell Drive was finished, Jackson Boulevard was finished, and then the, uh, the first segment of Front Beach Road and South Thomas Drive was completed with, to those types of standards. Um, but any, any project anywhere in the city ends up having to do a traffic study if it's of a, a certain size where it has a traffic impact. John reviews it. Uh, with their traffic consultant and then there is a certain amount of per trip fee that gets associated with it and it gets assigned to certain roadways depending on the impact. Then John uh, uh, makes that as part of condition of a approved development order and then before um, they actually submit for their building plans just like they do for sewer and water impact fees they pay that fee which goes into a fund that the city tracks for roadway improvements to whatever roadway was impacted on that. So with that overall general setup, I'll ask John if he can come up and he can maybe speak specifically to this area. And I know he's had a little bit of conversation, but it's, I think it's a little bit preliminary in his look at it. Right. I, I've been just for the record, I've been talking to several consultants uh, that basically they were asking some general standard question about our requirement if they end up to do the traffic study for the proposed development. Um, as a general, as Mel said, normally based on the type of land use, we develop uh, the uh, the number of trip within a peak hour day, uh, and then based on that, we distribute the the, uh, the number of trip that will be added as a result of the development to the transportation network, and wherever those uh, trip will be assigned, and if they fail. If they're assigned to a failed roadway, for instance, in this case, would be Back Beach Road, Front Beach Road, North Thomas. Uh, those will be subject to the proportional fair share. And that has been established based on actual cost of the improvement to bring the capacity to an acceptable level of service. And for in case of Back Beach Road, six laning is the solution. And 
we have developed uh, cost per trip uh, and anytime we have any new development such as Walmart, Pier Park North, they had to contribute uh, towards the uh, that type of capacity improvement. Uh, in case of uh, proposed development, really this is not a standard land use. Uh, you know, when you have uh, you know, amusement park like we had earlier, uh, or medical center, or any type of development. If you go to our uh, standard manual that we use normally to develop the trips, uh, there is a code and then uh, an estimated uh, trip that will be, or rate of trip that will be generated by those type of development. Based on that, we would develop the number of trip. In this case, uh, I've heard up to 3,000 uh, people will gather at one time, three to four times a week. So really, uh, if, if it's approved, this condition use approved, uh, eventually they have to prove to us what will be the impact of those 3,000 in the transportation network. So it could vary, you know, if they say they're gonna, uh, the way that we look at it really, uh, if you just l use that, uh, logic say if it three thousand if they we have two or two and a half per car that could generate about twelve hundred to fifteen hundred uh, trip in in an hour and multiple that number by sixteen hundred you could have two two million dollar impact fee you know for the case that's the worst case scenario but they're obviously a uh, way of distributing the traffic or you know, imp impacting some other factor and, and reducing the trip. But when you, you know, say the impact fee, you mean the cost for the additional roadway improvements, or what? What? What are you? That would be a cost for six laning back Beach Road or four laning improving front Beach Road. Now, if they have immediate impact, such as failing um, Alf Coleman Road or intersection at Alf Coleman Road or uh, Beckridge or Richie Jackson fails, they have to improve that as a part of offsite improvement as well. And do you have an idea what the traffic study costs? <coughs> oh, the cost of traffic study uh, depend on, uh, of course, consultant, but uh, at the same time, you know, uh, it could vary from 10000 to $50,000, depending. You have no historical data to go on then in order to assume how kind of traffic we're going to be looking at because we don't have any given figure right. out there that we can bend on so it's it just top of my head number that I throw at you you know it just could be as easily we could get to two million dollar impact okay. do, you, do you look at the high side low side or high someplace side. in between you kind of have to look at the high side I would imagine Absolutely. based on the what, worst case scenario you know what they're what they're giving you at this point for the <coughs> traffic pattern but they would get credit for what the grocery store. No, they, they would uh, not get no credit way. because no. normally uh, you give credit to a establishment or business if it's in business and they're remodeling, and they, they haven't been out of the business for a year or so because this has been vacant for the last four years. Really, what we're going to be looking at what's out there right now. But what was the traffic impact when Publix was there and strive, you know, alive that, and well? That, that was then, you know, we, we I mean, it should the, give you a jumping point to know. There, there was some credit at that time, that's true, but right now we look at the existing traffic. Is your uh, question what, what they would have to pay for their prop share? No. Okay. My question was, you have a traffic study from when Publix was there. It was about 2,000 trips okay. uh, per Don't day. Uh, so it's about 200 uh, during the <coughs> hour, about 200 at the max. So the parking lot would take about 100 cars. Right. Yeah, at the time that Publix was uh, developed, I, I remember I was, as a matter of fact, the one that reviewed the traffic study on the county side. Um, you know, we, we looked at the study at that time and the available trip on Backfish Road or Front Beach or Middle Beach in general, and there was no traffic impact whatsoever. The only thing that I asked him to do was uh, to do the turn lane on Richard Jackson, basically a left turn lane, and some turn lane on Middle Beach Road. So regardless on that, we cannot really consider whatever they initially 
had as a credit towards the development. I just thought that maybe it would give a springboard of what the cost might be to get that study done since we already know a base. I think the study is minimal for their. Okay. That's the, what I want. What the result <laughs> of the study is what they don't want here. Okay. okay. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. sure. And the, the other question, Mel, was the um, Mr. Snodgrass asked me, and I told him I would certainly ask uh, you folks if the city had ever, ever entertained the idea of um, maybe doing a, uh, about the tap fees on all the restrooms that they were adding, about doing a, um, maybe pushing that forward to pay that fee at a later date, if the city has ever entertained uh, doing Something that's not like something that's going to be necessary. Um, okay. Yeah, um, Clyde is a friend of mine and okay. was reaching out, so there's some things that he was privy to and some things he, he wasn't, too. Okay, so uh, so yeah, the, the impact fee is I not just a, told him I yeah, was that's a, that's a, those are, that, that anyway. that's a, that's a, it's an easy number. The big number was the $2 million. Okay. Um, and I think the issue we had with the traffic was um, that, obviously, in this situation, they had really nothing to go by, so they have to assume the worst case, which, you know, Legal capacity of that business, you know, could be over 3,000 people. Um, we, and I don't know if I touched on that earlier or, or not, but um, we've actually um, p built in our lease and, and, and informed city, some city staff that um, we limit that capacity to 2,000 people unless we pulled a special event permit from the city of Panama City Beach. Um, that way that it was a more manageable number um, and uh, it would help um, make sure that we weren't doing anything major, any major events during a peak time of the year. So that way the city could say, okay, that's a good time there. You can do a bigger show that would allow you to, to bring things. As of working with the Gulf Coast Gems or something like the Jazz Festival, which you know I spoke with Jim and them about, and they're very interested about, we're using this as a, spy, as a fall destination for a, another Jazz Festival another time of the year. Um, but as far as, as the traffic goes, um, I think that, you know, understanding their worst case scenario being, you know, 3,000 people, it's more realistic, more realistic as now as a 2,000 person. And the fact that we're limiting to once a week, they're in a non-peak time, I think has to mean something. And I say non-peak time, obviously during the summertime, as spoken with um, the chief of police, um, non-peak time for a traffic study and non-peak time for Panama City Beach is a little different. Mm -hmm. um, peak time for Panama City Beach is going to be in that, that late evening area where you have people cruising the strip or, or going to dinner. So it might be peak time for Panama City Beach, but it's not, from what I from my understand, peak time for a traffic study, peak time. So the, the amount of peak, peak time trips we generate is actually very minimal because it's during that later part of the evening. Um, now, there will be some impact if it's a busy weekend or something else going on. There could be some potential, but as far as um, traffic queuing in the streets or anything like that, um, if you've been to most concerts, um, that doesn't really happen. People start showing up two or three hours early and and slowly kind of filtering in. And you know, if the show starts at nine o'clock, there's two or three hours that these people have all pulled in and, and came in at an early rate instead of everybody hitting the roads and coming in at seven o'clock in the evening. So it's a gradual process that, that happens as well as the, the exiting is a gradual process as well. Um, and I think that, you know, if, excuse me, John kind of touched on it before. Uh, I think there was a little, um, uh, being the fact that building a set there, um, unattended for almost four years, um, it was not vacant per se. There was a lease being paid on that building the entire time. That's the reason there were no, nobody ever moved in there is because Publix had a lease up until two months ago and they bought, did a lease buyout. And when they agreed to lease us the building, um, so that's why nobody's been in that business. Um, there's been, um, not to say there's a lot of people beating down the door to get into it, um, but that was one thing that the, the owners of the property did have going for them is they did have that remainder of a public's lease at the time. Um, you know, really, there's been a, really a, only a couple serious inter, you know, uh, interests uh, to this building. It's been a, another gym, which decided to go somewhere else, and a furniture store, and a church. But once they saw what had to be done and the amount of money that would be to invest in this building, get it up to that kind of uh, use, uh, all walked away. I guess at the end of the day, it boils down to what do you want to do with this facility? Because anybody, um, for most other uses, because it is technically been sitting over a year, there's no more vested trips in anything. So anybody that came in here would have to pay a pretty significant amount of share of a personal use just to get in that building. And I, I think all we're asking is a, a to sit back and actually you know use our self-imposed restrictions, limiting to the events at certain times, once a week, if there is a major event like that, um, I think there's a conversation that we, sh that we might be able to have with um, maybe John and some other city staff about 
you know, making that ship proportional fee a, a, a reasonable rate. Um, just because I'll tell you now, two point uh, two million dollars is, is a deal breaker for us. Um, that's the budget for the the entire the entire build out, the entire everything, and that essentially double the price, and that's just for you know like some traffic and then. Can no. I ask you a couple of questions? We yes, ma'am. Going back to you're saying self-imposed, um, that you know you're doing it in your one-year lease, but you understand if we approve this and this change goes forward, and for for whatever reason after a year from now you don't plan to renew your lease, then anybody behind behind you can 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 use this in a different manner, and that and that's I think the trouble that we all have. Just you know, so if I could just ask you a couple of questions sure. about the square footage, because. It, 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 you, you said a couple of different things. Um, as I understand it, and pull from the property appraisers, it's about eight, 80,000 square feet. It's um, 70, 79 and change. That's the, in, that's the entire shopping center. We're, right. we're, Publix, we're taking right. over the public footprint, which is 56,000. How many? 56,000. 56. Yes. That's the, we're taking the, we have um, um, first round of refusals. Um, for the movie gallery space left over and the space next door, and those would be for offices um, and, and, and not assembly type spaces. But the space we're referring to right now, the initial everything is in that 56,000 square foot. Okay. 16 of that is in the restaurant, which, you know, if you look, if you've ever How been. How much is the restaurant? You're, you're the entire about. restaurant is, the broken down area is 16,000. And now that's not actual dining area. A good chunk of it is the kitchen area and, and back storage and loading dock area. It's the, the restaurant itself will be about 300 people on. That's 250 seating and around another 50 in non-stage um, seating for so people that just want to come and have a drink or a beverage and watch sure, the entertainment. Sure. So it's so the, the, the problem that what really worries me, and not that you're going to do it, because I, I've never heard anybody say anything bad about you at all and how you do business. There's a gut business in town regardless of La Vila or, or any of it. I, I, don't, I don't know anything that except I believe whatever you're telling me is, mm -hmm. is the straight-up truth, but for whatever reason, if something happens to be there and someone else gets it, then now Mel, I may or may or may not be right about this, but in in the assembly, fixed seated assembly in seventy thousand square feet, it is um, it is rated one per fifteen square feet. That in in seventy thousand square square feet would give you capacity of forty six sixty six people in that building at one time if you chose to do that. Let's say. And if it is standing and not seated in the facility, it's one per five square feet, which <clears> equals 14,000 <000 throat> people, which it, I think that's what's bothering me and, and worrying me about it. Even though I realize you're saying you have a self-imposed 2,000 2, folks in there at one time, uh, 14,000 people it yeah. is insanity uh, in, in that area. Now, Mel, do you, am I reading right or am I wrong or no those are the numbers you're right um, we're not leasing the entire shopping center well I, all I'm saying is if you have the first right of refusal if, if we if we change this and and I was I was in my understanding and what I read here it said 80,000 square feet is what the staff analysis said and that's that's what when I was doing my numbers right. I was going <laughs> by what not only was in theirs but also mm. in in your in your numbers back in your document the um that that was that was the, the in, in, um, economic Im impact study that you're looking at right. that was done when we were looking at the um uh, the Waynesville location, which okay, is that's that eighty thousand square foot. Yeah, correct. Off, so, so I'm, I'm yeah, uh, obviously, yeah, yeah. My numbers, I, I obviously, sure yes, that and I'm that's why I can explain that. Um, we're so least at that point we have three hundred and fifty parking spaces on the site, and mm -hmm. um, I did. You know, I, I read in here that you had spoken with somebody from Edgewater and from uh, maybe the water park, so I, I texted Mike Stans, who's uh, CEO, I believe, over at, at Edgewater, mm -hmm. and he said there's no such agreement, so I don't know if you've got an agreement yeah. with somebody else. or. I didn't say we had an agreement. I said we had a conversation. I spoke with Rick over at Edgewater, and I also spoke with um, uh, Will Lark over at Edgewater, and he was waiting for Buddy to get back in town yeah, to give us a final, yeah, final yeah, okay on that. But it, it, it worries me because... Like the small shopping center at Grand Panama and the bank and the Edgewater mm -hmm. shopping center, you know, the illegal parking could become such a nightmare over there that the restaurants and the bowling alley and all the folks over there that really are limited parking mm -hmm. now would be uh, in, a, in, a, in a bad quandary on the parking. So that, that's, you know, if you want to speak to that. Sure. Um, 
uh, anybody that's in the entertainment business um, knows that you sell out or pack maybe 25, 30% of your shows unless you're doing some really next level huge stuff. Uh, we anticipate uh, in most of our events being that 1,500, 2,000 people range. Um, going back to what you said regarding the 70,000 square foot, that is the entire shopping center. Um, the first of our we have, we can expand any assembly areas, assembly areas into either one of those areas. Um, those would be for off, additional office space, storage, things like that. Um, I didn't, and we're taking over the 56,000 square foot chunk. Um, so there's no expanding to any other areas in that. Well, I can um, read through my numbers, but it's still. It's it gives you actually about 23,000 square foot of usable main event hall. But what could they, at that point, lease that area to someone besides you? And then that person, I'm just saying. Correct, yeah. I mean, um, I'm just wanting, I'm, no, most know, of it, I, I kind of. And, and that person puts in a restaurant or whatever that, you know, then where, where are they going to park and. As I said before, the building owner is, if, um, is not going to allow something to go in there that's going to make his property value go down and prevent him from leasing these other remaining sp uh, spots to anybody else um, or having any issues with any neighbors. Um, uh, the, the agreement that we have is between with us and the landlord. And the reason we volunteer the self-imposed restrictions with the landlord is because the city was concerned that if they allowed this to go forward, and we didn't behave as we said we would or do what we said we would, um, there was a mechanism to, to, to go back and say, all right, you guys are out. Uh, the owner has every intention to make sure we play by the rules and do what we say we will. Um, now, if something happens, we move, you know, they could make another agreement with the landlord, but I'm, I would be very confident that if there was another agreement with the landlord, it would be very similar to the agreement that we have in place because um, he doesn't want a nuisance in his facility either. Um, he doesn't want something that would impact his ability to lease these other remainder uh, spaces as well. The idea is to kind of turn this into something that, um, you know, bring in a couple of little other places to eat and some, some, you know, clothing stores or something along those lines that kind of really rehabilitate this destination um, and make it something instead of just an eyesore. I think there's been one tenant in that building the entire time it's been that poor nail salon. I'm not sure how, <laughs> I've never seen anybody there. I think the, the most use that facility gets or that space gets is the, the pass-through traffic from the, the subdivision behind. You sit out there, there's about, you know, two or three cars a minute to go through that, um, that back area, that back gate on the back of the property. And so that's the most use that shopping center gets. It's, it's pretty heavy of traffic, but it's not related to any businesses there. Um, but once again, um, regarding the, uh, if you were to grant this to us and what would prevent somebody else from coming in there, I, I, you know, maybe there is a way to, to, you know, grant the conditional use to just this particular company. So if something did happen, this company was dissolved, then the other company would have to go back through this entire process again. Uh, I'm not I sure. A question for Mel. Yes. I, I don't think. I think it goes with the land. That's what okay. concerns us. That sometimes that we're up here and we hear somebody say they're going to do something, and then either they're unable to do it and it falls by the wayside, and we changed it, and then they do something altogether different. You ride by and say, "How you know? How did that right. get there? We didn't. And, we didn't and prove that." That's right? always that's always a chance. I yeah. think that um, we have every intention of going there and being successful, right, and right. Uh, to not bailing out. Um, we have a one-year lease with three five-year extensions, and um, we anticipate being there for a while um, because the amount of money that we have to invest in this building um, is not just you know a couple hundred thousand sure. bucks. It's a good chunk of cash yeah, yeah. Um, for the amount of restrooms, restrooms, life safety improvements, exits, signage. Uh, we're, we're redoing the entire parking lot, the whole front facade of the building, um, re-landscaping the entire property. There's a lot of things that we're doing to rehabilitate that space so it's not such an eyesore. Yeah. Like I said, there's not a, I've been sitting there for, for a while and it's, I don't see a whole lot of people beating on the door to get into it. I think the fact that, that we have a private group a uh, local private group that's you know approaching the city by giving him a facility like this doesn't happen a lot. I think usually for a, for a city to get a facility like this, it's tax dollars being spent or it's an extra cent that's being added to finance something like this. And we're a private group looking to do it and essentially give this to the city. And and, give it, and I say give it to the city because um, you know, if you look over our website and, and to our, our, our business plan, um, this facility, we've already told um, – the community and everybody else, but it's free of charge for any community or nonprofit to use the space. Um, anything, and if it's the, if I'm not using it, which you know I will use it according to this, you know the main hall, maybe four or five times a month. After yeah. that, it's gonna be sitting empty. So if somebody else can come and take advantage of it and use it, as long as it's not costing me anything or they cover the cost of the building, it's more than welcome for them to, to use it. I had a couple of questions I want to try to get through mine real quick because I know other people have. 
have them. Um, the uh, under conditional uh, use explanation, page one uh, D, he said that um, at peak times the impacts would be uh, would be minimal during peak times. When you're saying peak times, are you meaning peak hours or peak times? Because it, it, on the next page it says special event hours. So when you say peak times that you're not going to, you know, it's going to be minor, does that mean spring break, 4th of July, Memorial Day, times when we're already overloaded in that well, area? Well, we didn't address, the only peak time we addressed um, from meeting with the city and other people was, was spring break specifically. So um, the limiting it, um, <laughs> to the peak time was mainly for the month of March because that was the most, um, I guess, the most worried or concerned part of the year. So um, you were talking about times of the year and not correct. times of the month. Correct. And as far as the um, the peak times, as far as the trips goes, um, uh, ben, are, ben, are you here? Can you come up here for a second? Um, I guess explain to them, um, during for our traffic study part, um, what's considered a peak time and a non-peak time. Um, Ben is our third traffic engineer. Now, <laughs> um, we, oh, again, are we talking about times like time, or are we talking about time, times time, of the like physical hours, hours, hours of the day? Yes, okay. yeah. Um, uh, this is our third. Um, poor Ben. Uh, this is our this is our third guy. Um, the first guy came um, and gave his recommendation. I guess they had a cover conversation with John, and uh, there were some issues there. And the level of study they're requiring um, at the point when they spoke with John was a level three traffic study, uh, which is the same study that Pier Park and Walmart had to do. Which we thought maybe that you know after speaking with some other people that maybe a level one would be sufficient. Um, we were most definitely uh, have no problem with the traffic study, but I think a level three and a five mile radius might be a little much for um, for the type and as far as the amount of days and times this facility would be used. Uh, but uh, Ben, if you could give us some ideas on actual considered peak time for trip generation. Right. Um, based on based on character of use, I, you have your name and I'm sorry, my name is Ben Faust at 100 uh, Richard Jackson Boulevard. Um, typically, when you do a study, a traffic impact analysis is based on uh, the character of use of the property. Uh, find a character of use that's similar to what you're looking for in the um, in the manual, the ITE manual, and uh, and it will describe for you when to expect those peak hours to be for those use, um, and then you try to distribute those load, th those peak hour uh, impacts across the network of traffic, and the network of traffic has its own peak hours uh, based on that. Um, but there's some uh, flexibility in that analysis, and there's also some inflexibility associated with the character of the uh, the study that was done to prepare the actual trip costs by a municipality uh, or a community. So uh, there has to be some matching of the way that you do your analysis for peak hour based on the character of the uh, analysis they use to develop their costs. Now, are you basing it off of maximum capacity that can go in that building when you do it? Um, it's typically done based on an, an idea of average use for, the, for it, but it's based on the idea of that average use at the typical peak time. He's the engineer who would be able to answer some of those questions more more specifically. Um, somebody else. Um, the nail salon, like uh, I mean, I don't know. I guess they're, they'll deal with it however they deal with it. They're just happy to have somebody in. Right. They're happy to have an anchor in but there to get some the business going. What is the difference in your phase one and phase two that you're talking about? Well, here? what we originally proposed was phase one was going to be opening the main hall, subdividing the building, opening the main hall first and then bring on the restaurant online sometime around summertime. Um, we have since, we yeah, we, we did reverse that because there were so many concerns that if we were gonna come in, get the building, open up for spring break and, and bail out. So to address some of these pop-up club, you know, descriptions that we were being, um, they were being thrown around or, you know, to help make people feel a little more better that we were actually planning on coming here and opening the full business, we decided to reverse the phases, open the restaurant area first and then bring the main hall on sometime around summertime. That would also give us time to hopefully work with the city on some traffic issues and go through this process and uh, make sure um, that we are able to, to go in and perform eventually um, what we want to do, which is having the restaurant and the convention space. Okay, the, um, under your projections on the gross attendees, they vary on, on three different pages. I was trying to come up with an idea of annually 
what bed tax you would bring, which is really important. Yeah, it's in the economic impact study. It breaks down each type of event and the annual impact. But it, 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 it never all, I mean, from one page to the next, it, it varies. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out how you came to it because it, it, like on page six, it shows 397 room nights in 2014 and 497 in 18. Um, but then when you go to that third, the two pages after that, it shows 994 room nights. Is this a, is there a, some sort, something I'm missing here, yeah. or is it? Um, we did a, a 20, two, 2014 projection, and the next one was a 2018 projection showing the growth right. in the two. Um, but when you look at when you look two pages after that, it shows a completely different number, the 994 uh, room night number. I just don't know if these are if these are old projections or if they need to be tweaked or what because they just, they don't add up. The the uh, formula that was used was uh, used by the state of Florida to generate these types of things. It takes into account um, uh, many different factors, and I actually um, uh, I can I can provide those the actual detailed formula that was used. Um, I don't have them on me right now. I can't pull them up on the screen, um, but it, this is the economic impact that we used um, on that on that study was to show new additional um, economic impact, not just um, money that would be taken from, say, an existing business saying, you know, money that's already coming to town. This is additional business that would be coming in as a result of a convention space or another concert venue or something along those lines. And then I just had one more question on your, um, your amount of um, income for concert. If we base that using the 2018 numbers, your numbers, of 2,400 people per concert, 23 concerts of 53,200 uh, would be 386,400 tickets. Uh, that would equal like $7 per ticket. Is that an average of what the concert, um, what, I mean, is that like a door fee? Is that like a... The, you're talking about the price? Yeah, when, yeah, I, what, when we, I did the math on the concert, correct. it broke down to $7 yeah. per ticket. So what I'm trying to figure out, is that, that like really a concert or is that like a at the door? Yeah, I, I, okay, we, it was lumped in anything that was had music in it was considered a, a concert. Some of those would be free events. Some of those would be $25 events. Some would be $10 events. So there's no, there's, it's no way to, it's kind of like an average. Uh, we you know, said that we'd be doing anywhere from 21 to 23 events, uh, concerts per year. And it, depending on the type of um, uh, that, once again, study was done for the larger um, Waynesboro location. Um, we have now um, presented um, or proposed that we limited. It's different. Than it's a little different, yes, ma'am. But um, when um, I think of concert, I'm thinking ACDC, and you're not going to get into seeing this stuff. Absolutely not. And so, as concerts varies of different types of, of we want every, not everything we do is going to be a, a a sellout. Like I said, a sellout show. Some of these will be, you know. Should, should people might only have 500 people show up. Some might do 2,000 people. Um, I think that we limiting ourselves to 2,000 person capacity for the main hall for a standing only um, uh, event, uh, and unless we get a special event permit from the city of Panama it City just Beach. Seemed like the seven dollars just seemed like it was a more at the door. It was just charge. an yeah, it's a cover it's charge as an average charge. over the different which, price of the events. Yeah. Some, might some might be 25, some might be five. It could be but just it, depending on type but of. But you event. see, that kind of makes Correct. me think it throws it back into a nightclub. Well, ticket prices are going to vary depending on what's going on. Not every ticket concert ticket is going to be the same price. Some might be a five dollar concert. If it's a event that's more of a community type event or a fundraiser, it might be only a five dollar cover. If it's a a major concert that we have you know seventy five thousand dollars, then it'll be a twenty five or thirty dollar cover. So that's the variation between the two. Anything else? Not for me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they were good questions. Well, that was one. We got about four more to go, I think. <laughs> okay. Does anyone have any other comments? Okay. How are we doing? Okay. Hold. Okay. All right. Does anyone have any comments for Mr. Fitz right now? Not right now. Okay. Not right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we need to go. Well, I think we're. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as a as a lead in to um, public discussion, um, and while she's setting it up, and then we're going to take like five minutes. These are New York five minutes. Nah, Panama City Beach five minutes, and we're hey going to return. But in just a minute, uh, I'm going to ask the police chief to come up. He and I spoke at length this morning about, um, I spent quite a bit of time this weekend looking at the various proposed uh, items that would take place uh, in this facility. 
and um, conventions, trade shows, consumer shows, banquets, meetings and conferences, assemblies, religious events, courts. I don't have much of a problem with any of those. Okay? I don't know how many other people do, but we're, we're talking about very limited numbers of, of people that would attend these. Expressing an opinion also, these are all economic losers. There's no way you're going to make money on stuff like this. The money, of course, is all in the concerts and the entertainment, and I'm not sure what entertainment actually means, so I'll just use the word concert. Um, and I tried all weekend to try to figure out how this could be approved and how the concert portion of this thing could be controlled. And the only thing I could come up with is special, the special event permit, which right now I believe Mr. Leonard is 500 people or over. Per over what's customary. Over right. what's customary in a given hour. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Anything above and beyond 500 people in a given hour, above and beyond customary normal. Customary to that site. Right. Requires a special events permit. So I spent all weekend trying to figure out how the concert aspect of this thing can could be controlled. And uh, naturally, I had a great idea until I met with the police chief. He told me to go away. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but Way he to was polite about it. So what, what I'm going to ask him to do, are we ready? OK. What we're going to do, right now it's 27 minutes of. We're going to take five minutes, and then we're going to start out with the police chief, who's going to express his views and also comment on uh, my thoughts regarding special events permit, and then we're going to open this to the public, okay? Five minutes, New York, five minutes. Friends, we're not from New York. We were in the we South, buddy. <laughs> 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 